Welcome to One Sharp Sword, cutting through to what matters most. I'm your host, Dr. P, Dr. Wayne Purnell, the Exponential Success Coach and the President of Dynamic Leader, Inc. Today, I'm going to read this because she's fascinating. Uh, my guest today is a woman who had social anxiety and body image issues. She was a business consultant for almost two decades, and then she began to focus on helping others in a different way. Starting her coaching company, the Coaches Plaza, from a list of just eight names, she quit her corporate job in just four months, and less than half a year later, she was able to invite her husband to do the same. And now, her business has generated over $2 million in revenue. Here to talk about her journey of perseverance and building authentic connection in the coaching and consulting world, my friend, Amanda Kaufman. Hooray. Hooray. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It is, um, you know, I've just had this smile uh, since you and I spoke and we talked about you coming. So th it's really great. It's really great. You've got, uh, your journey is amazing. When I first met you a decade ago, maybe more, um, uh you, you were on such an amazing path and you've turned that amazing path even into more amazingness and i just i wanted to share your story with our audience the listeners the viewers um and those that get to see the little re amazing real clips that we'll put together um we were <laughs> we were talking about your name just prior to hitting the record on this and i wanted to uh use that as kind of an introduction to your approach in life kaufman right in german but kaufman in canadian, canadian um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it means it means like someone who deals in sales purchasing buying that kind of thing um talk about your what you had a fear of sales i did i so it's really interesting how i became a procurement expert that was my expertise as a consultant amazing and i became a global expert in purchasing and sourcing and procurement i used to help governments and uh organizations in different industries with their like how they went and stretched their dollars and got a lot of value out of their dollars and, and purchasing. And it was just interesting how I wound up in that world as a consultant. And I didn't realize until I was already working as a consultant that my last name did mean, you know, salesman, you know? <laughs> and, so great. And when I became an entrepreneur, sales was the thing I was the most terrified of. And you know, I didn't, I never wanted to take advantage of someone else. I didn't want them to think I was that sleazy salesperson, um, you know, the car dealer or something like that, that kind of uh, stigmatized image we have of that person that does a bad deal. I always wanted to have great deals. And, oh. but for some reason, being on the other side of the table, being the seller petrified me. Yeah. So this is, this is huge because most people are afraid of being that person we've all had one experience maybe maybe two maybe even a half a dozen with the sleazy salesperson if you think about the salespeople in your life they haven't really been all that sleazy but we always you know are afraid of being that person i think the other thing and this is huge uh because so many of us rely on being able to talk about what we offer, right? So that's sales. And so to to approach it, I think one of the biggest things that we face is the fear of rejection. What if we put ourselves out there and we show somebody our baby and they say it's an ugly baby and they don't want it, right? That's what I discovered was ultimately at the root of it. You know, I was really afraid of being seen being rejected, being abandoned, being told that what I had wasn't all that good after all, you know, and I think when you invest so much in your skill sets or, or wanting to do a good job by other people, it's only natural to be so worried about, you know, well, what if 
what if they don't think it's so hot? What if they don't think it's so good? And to take that on board to mean something about you as a human, as a human being, yeah. and you know, it kind of takes yeah. you back to being that kid that was bullied on the on the playground, and and all of those kinds of feelings come up. So, what was your reality? Because the fear is always bigger than the reality, right? The the boogeyman in the closet. Oh, it's a shadow. Like what? Um, so so here's this. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be abandoned. If I'm abandoned, I'm isolated. If I'm isolated, I won't have what I need. I will shrivel up and die if I don't make this a sale. Yeah. I mean, like my reality at the time when I wanted to make my my business work was I was replacing like a $250,000 corporate salary and benefits and the whole thing. And, you know, I was pregnant with my fourth kid. So, you know, we have a family, we have a lifestyle that we're supporting. And, you know, it's so funny when you hear the word lifestyle and you think yacht or pool. And I'm like, no, minivan, <laughs> you know, life yeah. insurance, you know. I think that's really important too. We talk about, you know, build the lifestyle you want. And really, like, if you've got four kids and one of them is an infant, the mm -hmm. minivan is the life you want. It's like, just make it secure and safe and comfortable. Exactly. You know? exactly. I'm like suburban mom coming at you hot, you know, like that's my <laughs> lifestyle. But still, you know, I, they're, they're, they really did feel like a lot at stake. And what was so funny is that when I felt like I had a big corporate machine behind me, the deal that I sold before leaving corporate was worth $10 million. But when like the very, very first deal that I did as a coach was 10 bucks per hour to my very best friend. And she like cajoled it out of me. She's like, come on, you know, sell it to me. And, you know, bless her heart. Cause like, I'm really, really grateful that she pushed me to do some kind of transaction. You know, she never actually came to any coaching sessions, just BT dubs. Pro tip, you want to be more expensive than somebody's Starbucks habit if you want them to show up to a session. <laughs> that is a pro tip. Pro tip. But I'm so grateful she did that because just going through the motion of the Venmo payment, it was Venmo, um, and collecting the cash kind of startled me awake going, this is crazy you know like this is such a small amount of money but if but up to that point everything was a fantasy in my head and i think one of the the biggest things about fear is it's false expectations appearing real and when you have in your head all this rejection you're going to see all of this you know catastrophic thinking that we have about how terrible it's going to be that's false expectations appearing real. And what happened when we had that real transaction happen, the Venmo came across, the 80 bucks hit my account. I was like, that is a pathetic amount of money. Like that is a very small <laughs> amount of money. But now, but it it kind of broke this seal, you know, that that yeah. I had on this whole narrative and this whole story about whether or not I can make money. And the next time I went to make a sale, I raised my price to 50 bucks a session. And then it was, you know, 350 or something like that. And then I had a $3,000 package. And then I realized that if I was really going to go somewhere with this thing and really authentically place, replace, excuse me, $250,000 a year in annual income, I didn't know how to do that. And there was just something about acting in reality and, and like actually transacting and having real conversations with real human beings and finding out that they weren't laughing in my face, you know, yeah. and just having that interaction point caused me to get real with myself that like, oh, I don't know how to entrepreneur. Like I knew how it's to- different. Right? You know how to sales, but you didn't. Right. Know how, I was like, oh, my business. goodness, I don't know how to actually do this. So I turned around and hired uh, a coach, a mentor who then taught me the difference between a three thousand dollar package and a thirty thousand dollar package. Right. And 48 hours later, sold that. And the thing the thing about learning a thing mm -hmm. is you don't unlearn it. So you don't unlearn it. 
you yeah. don't unlearn it. So within six weeks, I had closed $114,000 in, in packages and sales. And so you can't unlearn it. You, know? you don't unlearn a thing, which I wanted to pause and just highlight because when you get a repeatable skill, when you get a skill, mm -hmm. and you learn how to make it repeatable. Mm -hmm. You learn how to expand it. It's like, well, I know how to sell this. Therefore, I might know how to sell that. Mm. It, it comes down to you, right? At that point, it's yourself, your belief. So true. You have to back yourself first, right? And I now think of that as confidence stacking, where because you did a thing in the past, you bet on yourself and you go, okay, well, maybe I could do this thing in the future. And sometimes we look at what we want to do and it's such a leap. It's so far ahead of where we are right now. And we think, oh gosh, that's impossible. I don't, I don't know that I could ever do that. And part of my ability to believe forward in the self is that I do that. I confidence stack. I take what was something that I did in the past that is related, you know, even if it's very tangentially related, and then I borrow that belief and I inject it into the future thing that I'm, that I'm wanting to learn or do. Okay. Let's pause. Cause that's, you, you gave so much right there. And this is the kind of thing that I want my, my audience to take with them. The whole idea of confidence stacking. Mm -hmm. um, so many people and what you said was the stopper for like a lot of people do look ahead and go, oh, it's such a big thing. That's such a big hill to climb. I don't think I could ever do that. Yeah. And so they don't start versus <laughs> doing what you did, which is you looked at, well, where, where have I been successful before? Like for me, for example, I sold nectarines to my neighbors when I was six years old. I love that. And we had a giant, we had a giant uh, nectarine tree. It was amazing. And I put them in a basket and this cute little six-year-old scrawny big ears, like all the, all the goofy things about, you know, little six-year-old me. And I'd go, they're two cents. Let's see. They're three cents each or two for five cents because a nickel was really easy back then, right? So so three cents each or two for five cents. Oh, I'll take 10. It's like, oh, and then I'd <laughs> sell my basket. So knowing that I could sell just by saying, here's what it is, here's the value. It's like, you take that. I mean, think about, um, the reason I bring that up for me is I want each of our audience members, as you're listening to this, like think about, where have you gotten what you wanted by just asking? It's so true. It's so true. For for me, I it's so funny because I never made the connection of, hey, the last deal that you sold was $10 million. I didn't make that connection until years later. <laughs> because boy, what would have happened if I did? Because in my mind, I was like, oh, well, that's not me. That's the company. And that's what we do is we discount ourselves out of the story. We discount like, oh, well, that wasn't me. You know, that was yeah. luck or that wasn't me. That was because the team was involved. That wasn't me, that was the company. And so I love those stories about when we were a kid or we did that thing when we were ignorance on fire. Those are my favorite moments because when you were completely ignorant and you still did the thing, man, that's great confidence stacking, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Cause you didn't yeah. know better. <laughs> Being completely ignorant and still doing the thing. Today, mm -hmm. as adults, we would say, cool, if it works, awesome. If it doesn't, I have to learn from it. There's no failure. There's lessons. Mm -hmm. And so either winning or falling down, it's a lesson. What worked? What didn't work? Mm -hmm. um, go be <laughs> ignorance on fire. That is going in my show notes. I love that. <laughs> I was just actually training my team about how do you move from visioning something or getting a really great idea to enacting it and building really pro strong proficiency in something. And I told them as I went through a bit of a cycle of a of, step-by-step of -step process on this, that there comes a point when you need to take action, you need to enact on your vision. 
And what most people do is they enact on that vision and the plan ends up working out maybe 5% compared to what your actual vision was. Because the vision is is a dream. It's it's something that we construct in our mind. <laughs> it doesn't yes. bang up against reality. So when you bang it up against reality, the very, very first time you go to do it, typically, and this is just you know rough statistics, a study I just made up, about 5% of the plan survives contact with reality. Yeah. And what most people do is they go, oh man, 95% failure rate. That means I suck. That means it's not possible. That means I can't do it. And what I've learned over the years is, no, that means you figured out 5% of it. Yeah. So you need to integrate the 5%. That's the confidence stacking. Integrate the 5%. And then when you reconnect to your, your reason why you're doing all that visioning, next time you run the simulation, next time you do that vision, guess whose vision is going to be way more informed, 5% better, right? So then when you run the plan the next time, guess what? You're going to win 10%, 15%. In my experience, it's exponentially better because you've got better information. And so then that confidence stack ends up being an exponential improvement over time. But a lot of people stop short after the first failure attempt. I love all of that. Um, it's, I am hoping that uh, <laughs> that our audience understands they just got a probably ten to $20,000 worth of value in those last two minutes. Like, think about that in terms of coaching. Holy cow. Right. Replay those last couple of minutes till you get it, because what Amanda's giving you is gold right now. Um, thank you. That's <laughs> that's awesome. And it really is like it really is. What do you do? We used to think um, two percent conversion. Holy cow. We got two percent conversion. That was really good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> two percent and so we would look at do we get two? Oh, we got 1.6 right and that 0.4 was the failure mm -hmm. <laughs> so exactly. it's really it wasn't oh 98 percent didn't it's like did we get that too so when you talk about you know five percent of your plan it's going to come through and then the next time you bring it up it's going to be greater and it's going to be greater that also goes back to skill stacking where you go oh i know what works it's also you listening to your, intu your intuition. It's also you gathering enough information from outside sources. So all of that plays into how you make your plan for your business, for your life, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say one more thing and turn it back to you for more brilliance. And that is that most of us plan our vacations with more detail and more thought than we do the next year or two of our lives and it's like come on right you mm -hmm. are building a the next like lever from which you springboard in your world in your life the impact you're gonna make it's really great it's sort of like well all right what's working and keep, let's keep focusing there what is working and how do we leverage that I love that. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, it it has taken me certainly a lot of time to one learn the learn the skill of integrating, integrating win because I love to win. Oh my gosh, I love to win. You know, and it's it's not about other people losing. It really is just I love to win, right? I was and, just going to ask you that, and this is I, I am doing uh, kind of some some writing around this because mm -hmm. uh, I think in most people's pasts there's either the i've got to win mm. and it is it is i will win in order to knock people down and that is how i win uh in order to win other people have to be decimated mm. um, and and so the idea of competition comes up strangely because really the win is over yourself it's not over other people. It's not about other people must lose in order for me to win, right? It's about me winning over yesterday, right? I used to be so afraid of competition. Okay, so here, here's how competition used to show up for me. It's like, oh God, if we're competing, uh, you're going to crush me 
I'm going to be a little bug under your thumb or whatever. And uh, again, it was like a huge assault on my ego. You know, I had an ego problem, dude. Like it was, it was, and it didn't show up cute. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like, a, I don't know what you would even call it. You probably would know, but it was just a self-obsession in the negative. It's I think like, that's what I'd call it. Is that what you would call it, dude? <laughs> you, you've had more schooling in this than I have, but I, see, what I've had to learn me, is that. I, I got out of like traditional clinical psych because I really got tired of having to pigeonhole somebody. So uh-huh. what do you call it? You call it what you call it. It's well, awesome. I call it self obsession, uh, self obsession in the negative, you know, yeah. and 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 that relationship with self is the opposite of self love, and you know, it's self loathing. That's you right. Know? And it was it was it was a constant reclamation of the self. It was constant reclamation of the self, and it was just a really dark, horrible place to be. And every time competition would come up, it would be a reminder of my own deficiency. And the reframe, and this has taken me years of practice, and I still have to practice this, as in like, it's a practice. I really have to be like, okay, Amanda, this is how we think about this. Um, Is when I see someone doing something great, that's in my lane, you know? Yeah. You applaud to, them. To appreciate, to yeah. applaud, to yeah. admire and go, wow, you know, this person is demonstrating what's possible. And to look at it in that frame, because when you can look at something with admiration, with love, and to go, wow, you know, they're demonstrating what's possible. And then you, for the, the self, to have the self-love to go, you know, that's possible for you, babe. Exactly. Good for you. That you. that has given me a level of peace that, goodness, goodness, think, that took a long time and a lot of, a lot of work. What's cool is that really good coaches do that work. Mm-hmm. You do it with another coach, like good coaches have coaches. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, high performing, uh, individuals, whether they're in business or in sports or any other field, they have coaches. And I mean, what you're talking about is what makes you a good coach. I've gone through it. I'm still going through it. Right. If growth mm-hmm. ever stops, we're going to stop being really good at what we do. So we True. have to find our own next level. That's what we do as a, as not just a good, but a great coach. It's what I've been fortunate enough to be your witness along your journey. Um, even though there was a gap and we just did some massive catch up. Mm-hmm. Holy cow, what a great journey you've had. And it's because of that self discovery that you can say, I'm holding a torch. I, I'm going to light the way so that you don't have to bump into as many walls as I did. You're still going to have to do the work but you don't have to bump into the walls. It's great. That's it. And and you know what's been really interesting like v- very lately. I've uh, I've also realized the value of the bumps. Yes. Yeah. You know, because I think I think sometimes when we're when we're coaches, we're experts, we're writers, we're content creators, we're we're often very motivated by our previous pain and we we don't want others to experience it. And something I've been really thinking about, I'm curious about how you feel about it. Um, But I've been really thinking about how, if not for my pain, I wouldn't be here. True. And sometimes that desire to rescue or that savior complex, you know, that desire to, to be the one, I think can sometimes actually interfere with the process sometimes. Like well, sometimes four- people really do need to experience their own transformation the way that they need to, to be able to feel it. Like for me to be able to flip my egoic experience from being self-loathing to self-love, yeah. like I had to, for me personally, I'm not saying this is anybody else's journey. I'm saying for me, I personally walked through some dark nights 
I spent a lot of money, a lot of time. I took lots of risk, you know, to be able to get to that place where I went, ah, like where I finally got my aha, mm -hmm. right? And it was like, no one could, no one could do it for me. I had to do it. You know, that, and I feel like the best transformations in my own life have been like that. I think what's cool is that once you get that first aha and you're like, ah, oof, and now I understand, you think you're done. <laughs> you think you're done. And then the next big <laughs> yeah. aha happens and you're like, oh, oh, growth for real. Oh, and then you start to wait for the next one and the next one because it's like, well, I feel really good in my life right now. I know there's more. <laughs> I wonder what I'm missing. Um, I think that's really great. You know, we we turn our pain into wisdom that we can pass on. For me, it shows up in my books, mm -hmm. right? Choosing Your Power, my first book, was about uh, 300 women that I'd worked with all combined into one voice. Mm. It's like, how do you show up bigger? How do you... Right. And it's sort of like, and, and, and oddly enough, my journey was similar to the work I was doing at the time. And so I turned 300 women plus my voice into that. And it's, it's like, you get to show up, you get to have a voice. And I mean, for you in your coaching is, it's like, you get to be bigger. That's, that's what you're showing people. And, and it's, it's great. It's really yeah, great. Yeah. You get to be you know, I, I like to say people don't really choose the coaching so much as they choose the coach. Yeah, it's what comes through us, isn't it? It is. It is. Oh. I mean, it's the coaching that really does the work. You know, it, it really is. But when it comes to that inflection point of that moment of choice, it really is like choosing the trust in that relationship. I think it's so great. You know you are bigger than the life you are leading. It really is time to attend to that thing you've wanted to do or have, but you've been putting off. It's time to step into that dream you've parked for someday. It's time to claim true well-being, both personally and professionally, without giving up the success that got you here. It's time to check out Dr. Purnell's signature small group retreat, the Exponential Success Summit. Explore ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. Seats are extremely limited as this is a very special small group event. www.ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. So what are you working on now? Like, what's, do you, you're continuing your coaching. Are you working on expanding that? You've got online courses. Um, mm. group classes. Like, I want you to talk about you and your biz. Go ahead and just like dive into you doing a book, you doing a like, or you're just going off on some adventure. Oh, I love this. Love All this. right. So, yeah. before you answer that, I want to point out one thing because you were talking about you've got to let people bump into the walls. My, I don't know if you heard that, but my Amazon in the hallway just like, anyway literally just as i said that <laughs> it, was, it was weird uh <laughs> oh God, like we call them the a word devices all over the like so if we say if we say that it'll i have one in the room i've you know my, oh i see i my, see my yeah. thermostat in the hallway it's like what the heck what i was gonna say is um uh, we let people bump into walls and we let people fall down. It's, I was going to point out, you have four children and yeah. at some point when you're teaching them to ride a bike, you have to let go of the bicycle. So they sad. have to get their own sense of balance and they may fall down very likely. Will they get up? Will they try it again? Right. It's under uh guidance and encouragement yeah and you're still going to let go of the bike so that they can do it on their own and i think that's part of allowing people the experience like coaching isn't doing it for them it's encouraging them to have the experience that's and exactly grow right. right 
So that's exactly right. Yeah. All right. So what's what's new for where's where is the amazing and wonderful Amanda Kaufman? Where are you headed? What are you up to? Wow. So I, since we last connected, I decided to deepen my coaching again. So I reopened my private practice after having that not available for a couple of years. So well, you were doing just online stuff? I was doing group only. I was only oh, offering so. group and I decided to open up a couple just a few private spots because it is very expensive to do that when you when you have the capacity to be able to do group it's very expensive to to offer um private <laughs> for your time exchange but i decided to do that because i wanted to get you know close to a couple of case studies again i i wanted to get back into the spirit of it again and um you know, I, I'm working with a couple of really, really outstanding coaches on their uh, on their business, on, on their craft in a really intimate way. And I'm documenting my process along the way um, because I realized that I could do a better job of, you know, building that up as standard operating practice to potentially be teaching other coaches the way that I do I call it co-created action coaching. Um, I think what's a little different about how I coach is I'm very uh, forward action focused. You know, a lot of coaches, it's, you know, I hold space too. I do, I do, but I just really do believe in the power of confidence stacking. And I really do believe in the power of getting that skinned knee and, and you know, that embarrassment won't kill you. And that, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you a heck of a lot stronger. And you're going to learn so much more about when you go out and you do the thing and the relative risk versus the relative reward of really going out there and doing the thing is, uh, is so much more. So I tend to bias toward, you know, action and, you know, creating that traction and, and that real commitment um, I know a lot of coaching modality can be very focused in uh, exploration, and I, I love exploration. I think exploration is great as long as it goes to action. So I'm really say my style is a little of both. Yeah, that it's that it's like uh, a little reflective and always toward action. It's like why, like why are we coaching if you're not going somewhere? with it coaching is about forwarding the action it is about growth and and i um, increasingly am, am reflective on my journey as a figure skater you know and how much i pushed as a figure skater to get better uh season after season as a figure skater and i think you know i hear a lot in the coaching community about justification for for stasis yeah, you know I so i really? am Oh yeah, yeah. I'm here where I am because, and we use the explore we use the exploratory phases to justify stasis. I'm here because I oh, can't this tolerate that line with me, so I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, that's that's great. Like you got here. Congratulations. What's next? How do we lever? How do we use the leverage of what got you here for what's next? Exactly. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm all for bumping into walls, but you're going to bump into those walls a heck of a lot faster through action than contemplation. Definitely. Wow. Can I uh, divert a little bit? Can I get personal? Do you mind going? Do it. Okay. Um, I didn't know that you were a figure skater. So <laughs> how old were you when you figure skated? And I officially start. Gosh, so I farted around when I was five, but I officially started uh, with coaches when I was six. Okay, so you had eyes on you, and this is where it gets a little personal. At what point did social anxiety and body image issues show up for you? Was that oh, goodness? Was that you know after you into your teens? Is that like because? You were a figure skater. Eyes were on you. Coaches were coaching you. Um, on the ice, I always felt like that was on the ice. So contextually, that that was, I was on the ice. <laughs> and I was usually alone on the ice. Um, Which you know, is scarier than anything sometimes. 
You it can be. It can be. Yeah. You can't I'm hide very... in a in a line, right? It's like you can't hide on a field. You're mm-hmm. on the ice. Absolutely. I would say that it got pretty intense for me when I left my hometown. So um, I would say that I was always like socially careful when I was growing up, you know, as a teenager and, and so on. But it really got very specifically pointed when I moved from my teeny tiny little town in, in Newvik Northwest Territories in Canada, which is wow. a town of like 3,000 people. Yeah. And I went to find my fortune as a university student in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, the big city of Saskatoon. Wow. And I still remember stepping onto a city bus for the very first time when I was 18 years old. So talk about being a fish out of water. So, yeah, I, I would say that I experienced a massive change in environment, culture, expectations. I also went from being like top academics, you know, to hanging on by the skin of my teeth. Uh, and I made it through C's get degrees. So thank God for that. But yeah, it was it was a really intense change and and I physically changed a lot you know like when I went into engineering I uh I like dropped everything to survive that experience as far as I was concerned so I I I really didn't skate as much I skated maybe once a week I went from skating five six days a week for hours at a time to like once a week for a couple of years in college and Mm -hmm. so I gained like 100 pounds in my college years. So that also had a huge impact on my body image. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of explains a lot, doesn't it? Well, I mean, you know, I think one of the reasons that I asked you is that you're so resilient and you got to a point of going, this is no longer serving me, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right? It's either a pattern or, uh, you know, whatever is happening for you that you go, I, it's time to, to change this up a little bit. It's time to regain control in this area. And, and I just wanted to ask you about that journey, because I think that story itself is actually a universal story. You know, mm-hmm. we're confident and competent as kids, and maybe we're coached to do something, and we have some skills, but then you know, it's like the hero's journey. We step into this place, the cave of the unknown, and all of a sudden we are battling things we had no idea that we would have to battle. That's so true. So true. And, you know, what's coming up for me too is like, as I finished the degree and, you know, I had the weight gain and I had all of that, I applied to like 148 jobs because I had lucid clarity that it's like, oh, this girl's got to make some money coming out of college. Like, (laughs) duh. You know, as far as I was concerned, that was like, yeah, happening. That would be happening. And so I landed a job with a big consulting firm. Um, But the truth was, none of the engineering companies were hiring me because I did get C's in that degree. So, like, they had options. But the what the consulting firm saw that wasn't really appreciated by the other the other jobs was here's a gal with computer skills problem solving skills you know she's got all these skills that turned out was a perfect fit for a consulting profile awesome yeah and that i mean had you not done that your path to coaching probably wouldn't have been would never have happened ever right never in a million years you know so that's the other thing. It was Steve Jobs who said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. And, and it's like, oh, this led to that, which led to that, which... Which put me in procurement as a Kaufman. Uh, there, exactly. And from there, you were like, I've had enough of this. Let's help more people. Right? That's right. So good. That's right. That's so good. Um all right, so you're still doing group coaching, mostly focused on on coaches who have mm-hmm. a coaching business, right? So yes, I love helping people with business. So, you know, I love like the the saying, you know, your mess is your message, because as we're talking about this, 
and I'm thinking about like the path and how did I get here and all this kind of thing. And, you know, if it wasn't for all that social anxiety and for feeling so out of place in college and all of that, I very much doubt that I would have been so coachy in consulting, you know, I, I doubt that I would have had so much like empathy and tactical empathy in my consulting style that I would have been like, oh, well, that should be what I should be an entrepreneur in, you know? Great. Funny how those dots connect, but it is. It I is. really hadn't thought about it until this interview. See, welcome to what my gift. Welcome to One Sharp Sword. Oh, yes, oh. aptly named. It's uh, it's so good. So, all right, I'm just, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Like, if people listening, watching, wanted to find you, you're on. You're on all the socials. You're on LinkedIn. Ah, yes. So I am on all the socials. You want Amanda Kaufman, one F, one N. <laughs> um, and if you want to come check out the Coaches Plaza, if you go to www.thecoachesplaza, that'll take you to my Facebook group where there's hundreds of trainings on how to market, how to sell, how to how to brand, how to be authentic in your coaching, consulting, expert business. And that's really my jam. I love people. I love helping people realize that they they just need to show up as who they really are and really show up though. Like really show up. That's great. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that coaches is without an E. It's like it's not the plural. It's the pos- it is the plural. Yeah, it's the plural. Because okay. we're all we're all gathering there. The coaches, C O A C H E S Plaza. I did not make that easy on myself because then I went and put it in the logo with the possessive, and it's just like not friendly for domains. It was singular possessive in your in your logo, which is why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, like that. Yeah, I did not make that easy on myself, though, did I? No. Mm-hmm. Time to change that up, or at least get I both. I think I might have both, but the one that 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 that'll work is with E S. All right, the coachesplaza.com. Um, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> what didn't I ask you? Like I I you know, I'm tracking our time together. I want to make sure that you have given um like at least the opening of your brilliance. I was gonna say given all your brilliance, like not possible. So <laughs> the uh the opening to the brilliance that is the Amanda Kaufman. Um I can't help but pronounce it that way. I'm really sorry. That's, that's okay. I don't mind right. at all. It's okay. uh, it's in it's original German, so that's pretty cool. Um, gosh, what did not ask me. I mean, is it fun? Is it fun? Hey, Amanda, is it fun? Yes, living your life on your terms as you designed it is absolutely fun. Yes, and it is, is and it is rewarding, and it's scary, and it's That's part of the fun, so fun, like getting used to, well, I'm going to risk this or I'm going to explore that. Like you leverage your curiosity and yes. then it's like, oh, oh, dang, that was a place I probably didn't need to go. Or, wow, that cost more than I thought. And I got like less out of it. Or, dang, that cost more than I thought. But I got See, people, people live in the like all this horror story about, you know, entrepreneurship, living your best life, making a change. And, and, and the thing is, is that your life can be, it's not a blueprint, man. Like there's, there's, there's so many ways to do it. And you know, yeah. there's all this hustle culture out there and there's all this, you know, it's, it has to look like X, Y, Z out there. And, and I'm just here to say like, it can be a lot of fun. And, and, you know, I think Jim Carrey has this story that he tells about his, his dad who had a chance. I think he was a jazz musician, had a real chance to go for it. And he never did. And he always chose like the, the safe, route because he he told himself these stories that he would be happier if he just chose the safer route and then he ended up getting laid off anyway and jim carrey's point was if you can lose being miserable why not lose going for what could make you really radically happy yeah because you might win you you just might win like 
you know, and 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 I think that uh, when it comes to the question of whether you know should I pursue that entrepreneurial thing, should I consider gaining that skill, should I write that book, should I take that trip? Uh, yeah, you should. You really should, because if you're putting all that time towards it uh, in your mind, you're thinking about it. Yeah, you really, really, really should. If right, and that's that's one of the, it's a key message. Like if it keeps showing up for you it's probably pointing you in a direction or you're seeing it mm -hmm. like your reticular activating system is going alert, pay attention here. And, uh, <laughs> and, right? and, and so, yeah, listen, it's what I call listening to the whispers. It's like, this thing is showing up. The other thing is just to remember that it, it's a choice to have fun doing it. Right. So Cause sure. you could come into it and you could go, every step of the way, what if, you know, and it's not about a lack or a lose mentality. It's about a curiosity mentality that's going to get you through. Yeah. And, and, and I, I really don't want to end us on a, on a downer, but I am going to just acknowledge that there are things that are going to be like less good that happen in your life. That's a guarantee. And so we have to do the work, you know, to guarantee that the fun stuff happens. Well, I think there's that balance. And I don't think it's a downer to say there's a, there are for every experience you've, you choose how to interpret it. That's right. And the down times are times to be doing some work. Okay. And guess what? The up times are times to be doing some work too. And can you enjoy that flow? Cause that's the law of rhythm. That's, 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 it. Look that's at it. nature. You know, we're we're uh, recording this at, in winter, and uh, guess what? Spring is around the corner. Okay, that's the law of nature. That's how it goes, right? It is how it goes. So, yeah, so enjoy it along the way. The seasons are enjoyable, right? That's right. Yeah. And you know what makes a huge difference? What? The people True. that join you on the journey. That's so true. Yes. So true. See, that's a great way to end this, right? That's up. What's there enjoyable is the people that join you on the journey and who you let it like it's again, it's your choice. So uh joining us on this journey, the amazing, the wonderful, the talented, the insightful, the brilliant Amanda Kaufman. Thank you for being here. I've really um uh, I just I love you so much. You're uh you you're such a good human your uh your journey is so good and i'm really glad you you came on the show today well thank you so much for having me i had an absolute blast thanks for having me yay all right this is one sharp sword cutting through to what matters most i'm your host dr p dr wayne purnell my guest today was is was amanda kaufman uh she can be found at uh well on all the social medias at amanda kaufman k-a-u-f-m-a-n uh and also at the coaches plaza.com one sharp sword cutting through to what matters most we'll see you here next time thanks for joining us <laughs>